everyone. Um, I am Lisa Rani. I'm the Director of Research at FERA. Um, welcome to the last session of the FERA Flash Talks, for the last session for this year. Um, I can't tell you how much I've looked forward to these talks every Thursday. Um, every single session has been uh, really good. Um, we were just talking about it. And um, today um, we have one last chance uh, to celebrate together FA Awareness Month uh, with some uh, more exciting research from uh, junior investigators working on FA. Um, they'll present their work in five minutes and one slide in very simple language. We are recording all the sessions. They are all posted. The previous one are already posted on YouTube, and this one will be posted um, right after the um, uh, today, later today. Um, at the end of the webinar, uh, keep your browser open to vote for the best presentation. The most voted presentation will get a prize. Um, one last reminder that there is still time to participate in the Lend Us a Muscle campaign. Um, stay active in May, share your activity on social media uh, to raise awareness for FA. Um, I want to welcome our moderators, G uh, Gabrielle Angiolelli and Mary Caruso. Um, they will help me here with introducing our speakers and take your questions. So after each talk, please type your question in the Q&A box and Gabrielle and Mary will read them to our speakers. Um, today, we will hear about, um, so one more therapeutic approach uses stem cells, and the rest of the talks are about developing tools. Um, we've had a session dedicated to tools for research, like animal and cellular models, and today we will hear about tools for clinical trials that can help us determine if a, a treatment works. Um, some of this might be biomarkers, and these are uh, biological measures that give information on how the disease progresses and how the body responds to a drug. And some of them are things like, um, for example, a carefully designed questionnaire where patients um, have a voice and report directly how they feel in a clinical trial. So um, let's get started and I'm turning it over to our moderators. I believe the first one uh, is Mary. Mary, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Good morning. Um, I'm Mary Caruso. I live in Connecticut with my two children who are now well into their adult years um, as people who family who's lived with FA since 1995. We are extremely grateful for the work today and all the investigators along with FARA for all their hard work. So with that, I would love to introduce Shweta Sahani, and she comes to us from All India Institute of Medical Science in New Delhi, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology in New Delhi. She's going to talk to us today on blood-based inflammation as a biomarker for FA clinical trials. Very exciting. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. I start sharing the screen. Hi, once again, my name is Shweta, and I'm a doctoral researcher at the Department of Neurology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I'm conducting my research work as a part of a collaborative team, which is led by Dr. Achil Kumar Srivastav at the Ames New Delhi and Dr. Mohammad Farooq at CSIR IGIB New Delhi. And it was even before I started my PhD research work, I'd been manning the role of a site coordinator for the FACOM study at our site. And it was during recruitment and assessment of FA patients that I realized how this disease, FA, progresses so differently from one patient to another, and that no two patients are ever the same. So this really made me think of FA like a vast forest and each patient's journey through this forest is like a winding path within it. My research is designed on the blood -based, use of blood-based information as a biomarker for FA clinical trials. So we all know that FA is a neurodegenerative disease which primarily affects the nervous system. And available research shows that when neurons are dying and degenerating, they release some fragments and molecules which are known as damage associated molecular patterns. Now these damage associated molecular patterns or DAMPs, they act as signals to which the body responds. 
these damps are able to come out of the nervous system they cross the blood brain barrier and there hence they enter the blood stream once these molecules are within the blood stream they then start interacting with the blood cells now blood cells we all know are sentinels of the immune system and once they encounter these unusual structures called dams and unusual molecules they mount a response in the form of an immune reaction which is known as inflammation to make it simpler for all of you inflammation is a natural response of the body by which it tries to protect itself from anything which is harmful to it or any injury which is happening its body's natural defense mechanism when it detects that something is going wrong so generally it is thought of as a good thing and it is used to ward off any potential threats and it helps in the repair and maintenance of the body but at times this inflammation can also become chronic and that is when it contributes further to the disease so now as a part of that response that i just spoke about the inflammatory response blood cells exhibit certain changes and these changes are in the form of uh, change in their gene expression patterns other than that there is also a change in the proportions of different blood cell types so when i say blood cells blood is really a mixture of different cell types there are b cells t cells eosinophils and neutrophils and there are um, proportions fixed proportions of those different cell types and when a uh, body mounts a response or an inflammatory reaction it, the proportions of these different blood cells also undergoes change so the hypothesis behind my research is driven by the idea to use these blood based inflammation as an invasive liquid biopsy tool to monitor and also assess the variability that we see in the clinical symptoms and also the disease severity in fa going back to the forest analogy that i brought in earlier these blood based biomarkers could act like signposts along the path and they could provide critical information about a uh, twist and turns that the disease takes in each particular individual so with this background our lab conducted a pilot study we took blood samples from 12 epa patients and 12 healthy individuals and we tried to see what is the difference in the uh, gene expression patterns between the blood of patients and healthy individuals and what we found was that there was not only a change in the gene expression pattern but also there was a change in the proportions of the different blood cell types which was the initial hypothesis so therefore to confirm our preliminary findings we decided to use a larger cohort of patients and controls to further and more succinctly identify the gene expression signatures of inflammation in fa So the lower panel of my slide captures the essence of my study design and its expected outcomes. For doing this, we take blood samples, we isolate the RNA from blood or even the individual blood cells, and then we utilize high throughput next generation sequencing technology of RNA sequencing and single cell RNA sequencing to generate the gene expression profile for each particular individual. now once we have this gene expression data this data is then overlaid with the genetic background of the patient when i say genetic background what i mean is the gaa repeat number profile and we all know that this gaa repeat number is a known determinant of the disease severity and disease progression rate other than the uh, genetic background we use detailed clinical information from each patient about the disease progression course and severity and then using computational models we are now trying to identify inflammatory gene signatures which also correlate with clinical severity in fa clinical severity in fa uh, i mean uh, it's it's about the clinical symptoms like the ambulation status let's say the presence or absence of cardiomyopathy or it could be even the extent of nervous system damage so once this biomarker panel is developed we then will deploy it to assess the prognosis of the disease in a separate cohort of patients for its validation and see if it is this disease panel or this gene panel is able to predict the clinical symptoms based on the expression data that we have for those patients and once developed and validated we believe this panel could provide objective endpoints for future drug trials for fa and also by following these markers doctors can navigate the forest more effectively adjusting the treatment strategies and also providing personalized care based on the unique progression of the disease in each patient
Besides, I hope that our research will shed newer insights on how inflammation could be a driver of neurodegeneration, how it is affecting the neurodegeneration, and it could further provide us newer avenues for therapeutic targets. Uh, so with that, I conclude my talk, and I would like to thank Farah for giving me this opportunity to present my work. I would also like to thank our research team and my supervisors, Dr. Srivastav and Dr. Faro, and of course, to the patients who consented to be a part of the study. I would also thank you all for being a wonderful audience, and I look forward to any questions or suggestions that you might have for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's incredible. Um, I do have a question, if you don't mind. I um, would not. <laughs> uh, have these biomarkers or similar biomarkers identi been identified in any other medical condition that you know of? Uh, people are working extensively on these blood-based biomarkers for ALS. So there has been extensive research on uh, blood-based inflammatory biomarkers in ALS, but uh, nothing as such for FA, although we have some studies which point to words which give us certain hints that there are, uh, you know, very specific signatures, blood-based signatures that could be utilized as biomarkers. So that is what our aim is, to utilize them and to come out with an effective panel, which could then be used in further research and further clinical trials. And has there been any evidence um, of a, like a, if there's a decrease in inflammation, is there a correlation between slower um, progression? That's what we are looking into. We're also trying to evaluate when we are doing the study. So we have patients who come with different disease severity, who come with different disease background. So we are trying to correlate that genetic, uh, genetic data, the clinical information with the gene expression data and trying to see how this expression data is varying along with these two. So a patient with less severe disease, does he or she have the lesser, you know, lesser induction of those genes or lesser expression of those genes? That is what our model is going to do for us. This model we are building right now. This is really interesting. So we do have another question. Um, as different drug treatments evolve for FA, can the DAMP profile direct individual drug treatments? And that comes from Mike. Yes, it can. It can, definitely, yes. If this was the hypothesis that there are dams which are which are crossing the blood-brain barrier, and though this has not been proven in FA as such, but there has been evidence of dams being released in other neurodegenerative diseases. So once we identify these molecular patterns, these could be utilized and effective mechanisms to block their action could be made as therapeutic targets. So yes, this could be a newer therapeutic avenue. I, I have a question. Um, so you're looking at the blood and you're looking at, you know, the different blood cell composition. Um, do you have a plan to look for inflammation in other parts of the body? I understand the blood can be a reflection of other parts of the body, but can you look at inflammation in other parts of the body? Uh, like so the, the idea here was that although um, FA as a disease, its major manifestations are not really in the blood. They are in brain, they are in the nervous system, they are in heart, and there are other many other organs in the body. But most of these organs and organ systems are not really in, accessible, and having access to them means invasion and invasive surgeries and all of that. So the idea here is to really come up with a tool which is non-invasive, which is easily accessible, and even then it can mirror or it can reflect some of the patterns, uh, which degenerative patterns, which is happening in the other systems of the body. So as of now, uh, we don't think we are really going into the other tissues because that again means having access to those samples. However, uh, a different group in our lab might be uh, is planning to work on a generation of um, cell cellular models. So that could be one way we could co uh, corroborate our results from blood and use them in cellular models, in vitro developed cellular models. Um, I have another question that just came up. Do you think yes. that twins or siblings with FA will have different damp profiles? They could have. 
we do when we do a patient evaluation as a part of this PACOM study, what we see is that even patients with similar repeat number or siblings, you know, who should have similar genetic background, they show a lot of diversity in their clinical symptoms. They are not clinically same. The age of onset varies, how the disease is progressing in the siblings varies. So based on that information, it is possible that DAM profile could vary somewhat between the patients. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Gabrielle, would you like to introduce the next speaker? Yeah. Um, sorry. So um, I'm Gabrielle, just a brief introduction. Um, I'm from Montreal, Canada. Uh, I've been, well, I have had, I was diagnosed with a vape 15 years ago. Uh, I have a degree in math. And I'm an associate actuary. Um, and I'm proud to introduce our next speaker, Niogo Shirashi from, uh, yeah, from UNICAMP in Brazil. And he's going to be presenting Say Cheese, Analyzing Images of Your Brain. So all yours, Diogo. Thank you for the introduction. I'll just share my screen. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm a computer engineering uh, engineer, and now I'm working on my master's uh, degree at the University of Campinas uh, in Brazil. So, today I'd like to talk about the dentate nuclear segmentation in magnetic resonance images using deep learning. And in, what, in other words, uh, as Gabriel said, say cheese, analyzing images of your brain. So the dentate nucleus is a tiny structure within the cerebellum, and we have one in each cerebellar hemisphere. Uh, the shape resembles a curved almond, and as a rough estimate, is about half an inch in length. Uh, the dentate nucleus is related to movement coordination and is also invo involved in cognition. And it has been shown in the literature that the dentate nucleus is a major target for of neurodegeneration in FA. And this damage follows a progressive pattern. And imaging studies also found damage even in the early stage of the disease. But in order to measure the dentate nucleus, we first need to take a picture of it. And you might be familiar with uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. And within this extensive field, there is a technique called QSM, quantitative susceptibility mapping. And QSM is a fantastic technique for capturing the effect and of magnetic distortion caused by the iron accumulation in the dentate nucleus. And here we have an axial sample, QSM sample image. So you can imagine a person standing upright. Uh, this is a cross section of the cerebellum um, parallel to the ground. And as you can see, uh, we can visualize both dentate nuclei represented by these two bright regions in each hemisphere. And so uh, we have two ways to analyze the QSM image. The first one is manual, where we ask a uh, neuroradiologist to do the segmentations, to do the manual tracings. However, this task is uh, both time consuming and segmentation errors are inevitable. So the research community has started developing automated tools to tackle these challenges and some Great models were created like the MRI cloud developed by the folks at Johns Hopkins. But we observed two problems. Uh, the processing time was quite high and we noticed some segmentation inaccuracies. So we proposed in our research to develop an automatic segmentation solution now using deep learning. And we are focusing on QSN measures and working as a potential neuroimaging biomarker to track the FA stage and progression. Uh, a robust solution and could benefit both uh, natural history studies and clinical trials for, for example. Uh, it allows them to see if a new treatment is working, is indeed slowing the progression of FA over time. 
and to do so uh, in collaboration of uh, with our colleagues at Monash University, we have been gathering data from several partners and currently we are undergoing some model training rounds, but we already and have the results for the first two ones. And as you can see in these two plots on the right, uh, both our models uh, outperform the MRI cloud. And here we have a comparison between the results uh, from MRI cloud and our solution. And we can observe some segmentation errors in the MRI cloud output, such as over segmentation over here and here, and some missing parts and here and here, for example. And in the future steps, one final step uh, involves histological validation and where we compare the model segmentation and in the MRI image with the corresponding histology measurements. And uh, lastly, I think it's important to mention that the dentate nucleus segmentation is just the starting point in the next phase uh, in the next phase of our research, we will look into the cerebellar uh, cerebellum and the superior cerebellar peduncle uh, segmentations as well. Um, lastly, uh, I'd like to thank Fada for giving us the opportunity to share and continue our research. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, no, uh, I will jump directly to questions. Um, I have one from uh, Jason. He asked, uh, what was the cost for the MRI approach for analyzing the FA stage? Yes, um, great question. If you already have the the these images, the MRI scans and the QSM uh, sequence, uh, this would be pretty straightforward. You just input the image um, to the model and we get the prediction. The cost is almost nothing. You, you can get the results actually in seconds. So I cannot even establish uh, uh, a cost for this. The, uh, the uh, acquiring the MRI sequences, uh, in fact, this is very expensive, but we are using, like I said in the presentation, uh, we are gathering images from the track FA, so from the track FA, from Naples in Italy, CMRR and Halle at, uh, in Germany. So all data is already, is already ready for us. I, I have one question if um, there are no other questions in the Q&A. Um, so how many scans do you think you need to create your model to have confidence that your model is, you know, good, predictive and, or, or useful? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a very important question because uh, some time some time ago, uh, there was a, a, a real, a new model uh, released by by uh, by some guys that they were doing segmentation on the cerebellum, which is indeed even more difficult than than the dentate segmentation, and they used only thirty images. And here we are using an uh, over two hundred images. Actually, we are almost reaching the number of three hundred images, and the more images you have, the better the model would be. Okay, uh, so I have a question from Mike. He asks, um, how does the dental profile change in, uh, uh, sorry, as FA advances? So uh, that's a, a, a very nice question. And I can't uh, speculate on that because I don't have access to the personal background on each patient yet. I will have this data. So definitely we'll look into uh, answering this question as we go further on our research. 
yeah so maybe i can mention um uh and also to it this might address another question that I see in the, the Q&A. Um, there is a big study that's called Track FA that does uh, measures, you know, some of these parameters and, um, you know, how the, there are changes over time in the spinal cord. So um, if you're interested in participating and, you know, it, it's, it's, it just started, it will measure these differences in this over the course of two years. Um, so eventually, you know, we'll know a little bit more about what happens to these structures over time in FA in, in a lot of different patients. And if you're if you want to participate, you just go to the FAIR website and uh, look for track FA and um, they'll tell you where uh, you can um, participate. What what are the centers that participate in the study? And Liz, if I can say a little bit more and this is a fantastic study, and it's the largest ever neuroimaging study for, for FA. And, and if more people join this study, indirectly they are helping our research because they are providing us with more and more image samples. I'm also a volunteer, so please join this study. You can enroll at places like University of Florida, CHOP, McGill, Monash, and Aachen in Germany and Brazil also, and here at Unicamp. Yep. And maybe just this one last question that says they ask if these dentate nucleo, nucleus um, anticipated changes over time will be volume based if you expect that the volume of the dentate nucleus um, will change. Yes, that's what we are trying to find out. So what we expected to, what we expect to find is a correlation between volume measurements and disease progression. So as I said earlier, and even in early stages of FA, we you can already see some uh, damage in the dentate nucleus. Great. I think there's there's a question on not related to this, but about the diagnosis and why. Uh, people, you know, uh, have the disease while their parents don't have it. And I just, I'm just going to uh, say quickly that the disease is a recessive disease. So you need to acquire the gene, the defective gene, both from your mom and for your dad to um, present symptoms. That's that's why if you have the disease and your parents don't have the disease, that, that's the reason. You need one defective gene for your uh one of, from both of your parents or so your parents are carriers so I have well, only one of the uh, genes that are affected and so they don't present symptoms carriers are um, healthy okay so I think we need to move on to the next speaker so our next speaker is Charlotte Engebrecht and she is from the University of Rochester um, she's going to talk on her work on developing two questionnaires the FAHI and FACRHI to measure outcomes in clinical trials. So Charlotte? Oh, thank you, Mary. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. So uh, hi everyone, my name is Charlotte Engebrecht. I'm a clinical research coordinator at the Center of Health and Technology. So a little bit about myself is I graduated from Hobart Million Smith Colleges in 2021. I uh, majored in biology and I double minored in chemistry and English. I started working at CHET, which is the Center of Health and Technology, about seven months ago, and um, I've loved every minute, and I'm excited to be in research. So that uh, leads me to what I'm here to talk about today. So um, the Friedrich's Ataxia Health Index and the Friedrich's Ataxia Caregiver Reported Health Index, which is known as the FA High and the FACR High. These are two surveys that we developed as outcome measures that are used to track symptoms experienced by individuals with FA, and they can be tracked during clinical trials and in patient care. So before I go into the specifics of how they were developed, I uh, want to first talk about what an outcome measure is and why they are important for the approval of new drugs and therapies. So an outcome measure can be a patient or caregiver reported survey. It could be a clinician reported assessment or a measure such as a blood test or a walking test. So these outcome measures are used to track changes from your baseline due to an intervention, whether that's a new drug or new therapy. And if a new drug or therapy is beneficial, an outcome measure will ideally detect that change. So for patient and caregiver reported outcome measures, such as the FA high and FACR high, 
Um, they importantly bring the patient and caregiver voice to the forefront of clinical trials. And they focus on the symptoms that are most important in FA health and uh, therefore help track changes in areas of patient health that maybe generic outcome measures may not cover. And finally, they can encourage the um, pharmaceutical company's interest in FA therapeutic development. So where these outcome measures can be used, they can be used in academic centers for initiated trials, government initiated trials, some pharmaceutical trials, foundation investigations, and registries. So I'm now I'm going to talk about how we developed the FA high and the FACR high. So they um, we started with qualitative interviews with 15 patients with FA and 15 caregivers of patients with FA. And um, we wanted to determine what are the most impactful symptoms in pregexpaxia. So we then uh, utilized these symptoms and implemented them in an online survey that was taken by 153 patients with FA and 49 caregivers. So following statistical analysis, the survey results were used to develop the first versions of the FA high and the FACR high. Next, we conducted beta interviews with patients with FA and caregivers of patients with FA. And this was to discuss the survey and how we can improve it, determine if any of the wording was unclear or if there was anything that should be added or deleted from the survey. Then lastly, we tested the reliability of the survey by having participants take it at baseline and then approximately 14 days later to ensure that the instrument is not overly sensitive. And what I mean by that is if you take the survey at baseline and then 14 days later, your score should not fluctuate too much. This then led to further modifications and uh, resulted in our final versions of the survey. And then looking at the graph on the, the right of the poster, so the, the FA high was able to distinguish a higher disease burden for individuals who experienced speech changes than those who did not experience speech changes. Um, as well as a higher disease burden with those who have cardiomyopathy versus those who do not have cardiomyopathy, and a higher disease burden for those who have greater than um, a 4 0 functional staging for ataxia than those with a lower functional staging for ataxia. And then um, a higher disease burden for those above the mean age of 31 than those at or below the mean age of 31. And then looking at the bottom graph, this is for the FACR high, which is the caregiver reported um, health index. So it was also able to distinguish a higher disease burden um, for those who experienced speech changes than those who did not, and a higher disease burden for those with cardiomyopathy than those who did not, and a higher disease burden for those um, greater than a 4 0 functional stage ataxia than those with a lower functionalization ataxia. And then there's, there are more analysis, but these are just ones that I wanted to include on here. Um, overall, the, the FA high and the factor high both measure 18. Um, areas of health. So examples of these are limitations with mobility and walking, impaired coordination, fatigue, emotional health, and, and so forth. And the FA high is designed for patients eight years and older. It takes on average about 15 minutes to complete. And the FACR high is designed to be taken by caregivers, patients five years older, and takes about eight minutes to complete. So that is my, my little spiel about the FA high and the FACR high. I wanted to thank uh, Vera for sponsoring um, and making this uh, this research possible, and then um, as well as everyone who came to listen, and I'm uh, feel free to to answer, or ask any questions and or put them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm sure you looked at the natural history study. Did you find any advantages to this questionnaire uh, compared to the questionnaire in the natural history study? So we're we're actually um, conducting a longitudinal study right now comparing our survey with other generic surveys. So I don't have an answer for that yet, but we are looking to see if, you know, which surveys that um, people with FA prefer over the other and what they think would measure their um, health better. Interesting. We've done many surveys <laughs> and they're very helpful. Um, when do you feel that your survey will be ready to introduce to a clinical trial? So we, the FA high and the FACR high are ready now to be used. So if there's a new trial going on, you can always talk to us and we can, we can get it out there. Um, but for the comparison to other surveys that that's going on currently and we don't have results for that, but the individual uh, survey itself is, is finalized. 
Great. So you said that uh, the uh, the questionnaire um, now is being um, also uh, used when you know during your annual visit for in in the FA comms. If you're part of the FA comms, are there other other ways that people can participate? Do you how many um, you know other how many uh, people you need to uh, recruit to further validate the questionnaire, and how can people participate? to help you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the thing about uh, the survey that we developed and how we, we had the scoring algorithm is we wanted to minimize how many people need to take the survey to validate it. Um, hmm. So we, I mean, as of, I, like, I can, I can give you information about um, backing that up with, uh, you know, certain clinical trials if they need like 200 participants or something like that with other outcome measures. And then in comparison with ours, you can have like 16 participants or 17 in which it's still fully validated um, it, because of the scoring algorithm is uh, more specialized. Um, and I know that there was a plan to sort of integrate it with the FA app. Can you, um, do you have any information um, on that? Or can people, you know, take the questionnaire on the app? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. I don't have the specifics about um, that, but I can I can lead you to the people that do and um, who are trying to implement it into the app. Great. And you said um, you there's this plan to measure to do to um, validate the the questionnaire or study the questionnaire longitudinally. So what is the plan there? Why do you want to um, you know see how the questionnaire does over the years? So yeah, we want to. So there's generic outcome measures that are out there that are widely used in other clinical trials, but we want one specifically for FA that may be able to pick up on changes that other outcome measures cannot. So let's say like a new drug um, is implemented, they're having a clinical trial and they, they use a generic outcome measure where it shows that there's not much change, but then if we use one that's disease specific and is validated for um, FA and used in that trial, it may be able to pick up on actual changes that are happening where the drug is showing improvement or new therapy is showing improvement that other outcome measures may not pick up on. So that can help um, further the process for drug approvals. Yeah, and, and just one curious, do you know if there are instances of PROs used as a primary outcome in a clinical trial? Um, there, Just, I think there are. I don't have a specific one for you or a specific study like off the top of my head, but yes. Yeah, so, so I, I think I've seen it like, like a secondary outcome, but I'm yeah. just curious if there are. I think it's more common to be secondary outcome than ever. Right. Yeah. And then I think we are ready to move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so I'm going to introduce. Uh, Anusha Sivakumar from the University of California in San Diego, and she's going to present a stem cell approach to treat FA. So all, all yours, Anusha. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Gabriel, for the introduction. Um, yes. So I am uh, Anusha Sivakumar. I work as a project scientist and a project manager on the FA program at uh, Prof Professor Stephanie Cherky's lab in UCSD. We, uh, our lab is basically a hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell uh, and gene therapy lab where we use the uh, cell, the HSPCs, which is the cells that constitute the blood system as a therapeutic uh, vehicle for uh, genetic diseases. So we work on, uh, so I have the two studies that we have done before on FA on the left side, 
So the initial is a proof of concept where we are trying to understand if uh, these cells have the capacity to treat FA as uh, by delivering a Fritax gene in the organs that get affected. So we had a GFP, which is a green uh, fluorescent protein that's tagged onto these uh, blood cells. And when they are transplanted into a FA mouse, we detected that all of these cells uh, got engrafted or attached into the organs that get affected by the disease. And it was able to deliver a fritaxin locally. And that helped improve several of the disease characteristics in these mice. So now that we have a vehicle and we know that we are able to deliver fritaxin to the organs, we wanted an approach that is more uh, patient specific. So we developed a gene editing approach where we use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to uh, excise the GAA expansion that's in the fritaxin gene. So the CRISPR-Cas9 is basically a molecular scissor system where it uh, specifically targets the fritaxin gene using uh, guide RNAs, which is direct the scissors onto the gene. They attach onto the either end of the GAA expansion and they just cut it off the DNA because uh, the cell system itself has the capacity to fix the DNA whenever there's a damage, it assumes that the cut that was made is because, uh, because of an innate uh, problem and it just fixes it. In. So the cells eventually that are produced from this process are relatively healthy compared to the original cells. And we were able to improve fritaxin expression using uh, this approach. So we tested this out on the HSPCs uh, that uh, we collected from uh, some FA volunteers. And we were able to see that in the lab, doing this CRISPR-Cas9 approach, we were able to improve the amount of fritaxin in these cells, and they also improved the mitochondrial function. So now that we have a vehicle that can deliver fritaxin and a method that is more for a patient by himself, we then wanted to do a efficacy study where we are trying to see when we use, oops, sorry, when we use the same approach, uh, in vivo, which is in uh, FA mice, are we still able to see the same results that we were seeing before? And if we are able to uh, reduce the severity of the disease or stall its progression. Now we have moved into a new mice model and these mice model carry about 800 GAA repeats in the Fritaxin gene. So the process itself is we collect these uh, bone marrow uh, HSPCs from a donor deceased mouse. We culture them in the lab. We excise the uh, GAA expansion, and then we give some time for the cells to recover from the process. And then we transplant it into another FA mouse. And then uh, we analyze whether these gene edited cells have the, still retained the capacity to uh, reach the organs that get affected by the disease, and also if they are able to alleviate some of the symptoms. So the data that I have down there um, is the preliminary data that we have, and we are working on the efficacy studies. So at six months post-transplantation, uh, we were saying that the gene-edited cells, which again constitutes all of the blood system, so we were able to detect uh, gene editing in the blood, we were able to detect it in the bone marrow, which is where these cells uh, set down as settle down as a reservoir of healthy cells to keep constantly supplying the uh, gene edited HSPCs. We were also detecting it in spleen and thymus. Both of these organs are again associated with the blood system, and all the systems that are associated now have the gene edited cells uh, as reservoirs in their body. And the organs that are affected during FA, particularly the spinal cord, the brain, cerebellum, the heart, muscle, eye, and pancreas, all of these steps, uh, tissues have now received the gene edited cells. We were able to detect them in all of the organs that we have tested so far. And this tells us that the method is uh, feasible. It also tells us that we, were we are able to reach all the organs. And the data below uh, that is a detection of the fritaxin protein expression, which is how we know that these gene edited cells have the capacity to improve the expression of fritaxin compared to a deceased mouse, where it progressively has reduced uh, fritaxin levels. So all of these data are uh, towards efficacy studies to understand whether the method is working. 
we are also conducting safety studies because CRISPR-Cas9 and gene therapy is always uh, approved based on how safe the method is. So we are also conducting safety studies to see uh, if there's any toxic effects that comes from the process, and that is also underway. What we see as a future uh, for this uh, study down the lane is we will be collecting um, the HSPCs from a FA patient, do the gene correction uh, in the lab, and then we try infuse it back into the patient. And it should be a one-time treatment that should uh, have a ensure a constant supply of frataxin and alleviate some of the symptoms of frataxia. And with that, I can turn my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Anusha. That was very interesting. Um, I don't have any particular questions. Uh, questions to you, uh, Lisa or Mary, have any? Yeah, I, I wonder if, um, Anusha, do you, you can speak a little bit more about how these cells help inside the body? What do they do? So uh, the cells that we collect are bone marrow stem cells, and uh, they differentiate into uh, what are called macrophages. Uh, just like how uh, Shweta was talking at the beginning, they constitute the blood cells. So they form the T cells, the B cells, uh, the macrophages uh, in the blood cells. So what we understood from our initial uh, GFP or the first study is that these cells differentiate into macrophages in the peripheral system, which is the heart and uh, other organs. And once they go engraft there, they form structures which are called tunneling nanotubes that are like bridges that connect the macrophages to the organs or the other cells in the organ. And they transfer the frataxin directly. So this is more a local uh, transfer system that happens in the heart. In the spinal cord and the brain, the cells that are similar to macrophages are called microglia. And these again go large into these organs and they again form tunneling nanotubes that were delivering frataxin. Even though the cell type uh, are called differently in both of the organs, the mechanism of how we see frataxin transferring between them is through the tunneling nanotubes. Um, so does your evidence in neural tissue show any differential localization or is the signal increase beyond typical FA targets such as the DRG? Uh, so we do see uh, an increase in the frataxin, and we were also able to detect uh, mitochondrially localized frataxin in the uh, brain system. So the model that we are working with right now is the YG, um, is the y Jack's available YG8JR model that carries 800. And in our hands, we were not able to detect the vacuoles that we were seeing in the, that's are typical of the Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, DRG structure. And so we are just looking at all of the organs that get primarily uh, affected. So what we use as a measure right now is to see if there's an increase in it for taxin expression compared to the disease mouse. And if there is an increase, is it mitochondrially localized? Because the functional form of frataxin is more um, in the mitochondria. So we were able to detect a mitochondrial localization in the brain. And are there any off-target effects of the editing? Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, so that was uh, something we did in the study too, where we were trying to validate the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 approach to see if we are able to have a very specific editing at the frataxin and if there's other sites that the guide RNA can reach to. And we did have some in silico predictions. And when we validate, validated them with wet lab experiments, we did not detect any off-target effects. So the CRISPR-Cas9 that we validated on the CD34 um, HSPCs from patients is what um, is the same reagents that we are using on these mice because it's a transgenic mice that carries the human frataxin. And so the components are the same that we use between them. So uh, as of now, we don't have any off-targeting effects that we were detecting in the CD34, and the study on the mice for off-targeting is still underway. But because the components are similar, we don't anticipate additional off-targets at this point. But we are still keeping an eye out for it. 
Um, I have a question from an anon anonymous attendee. Uh, they ask, uh, do we know that increased protection improves uh, phenotype? Um, again, that is also something we are trying to uh, answer, but uh, through extensive literature and what's being used commonly as an acceptable um, uh, acceptable rescue is there's an increase in protaxin and the downstream that target the downstream effects of it. So for now we are looking at fritaxin expression as the initial uh, stage to validate that the gene editing itself is able to do what we want it to do. And we are also looking into other reported um, uh, disease phenotypes with FA like the oxidative stress or the expression of mitochondrial ETC complexes and uh, the uh, mitochondrial biogenesis marker, all of these are extensively studied. So while the data that I'm showing here is only on the fritaxin expression, we are looking into all of them to see if there is a cumulative effect uh, from everything because of the fritaxin expression and if it's able to rescue the phenotype based on that. But I, based on the literature study that we have, we do understand that fritaxin expression is used as a measure to show disease phenotype rescue. Okay. Um, and I do have a final question from an, another anonymous attendee. Uh, they asked, how will you translate this into treating an affair? Uh, so the study is eventually aimed to uh, uh, reach the uh, clinic. And what we have right now is establishing that uh, when we do a CRISPR-Cas9 gene correction, gene editing on the HSPCs, are we still able to treat uh, some of the symptoms of the disease and assess the safety of this protocol? When we, once we have both of these established, uh, we will eventually move into uh, a clinical trial that the outline of which is the picture that you see as a future direction. And that's how we see it translating into a patient where we collect these HSPCs from the patients to the gene editing in the lab and reinfuse them. And that is where we are aiming the entire study towards. Okay. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, thank you, Anusha. Um, and um, thank you, Gabriella and Mary. That was great. Um, thank you for moderating. Um, and we're grateful to all our moderators. They are all done a terrific job. Um, thank you to today's presenter and thank you to all the junior investigators who have participated. Um, I really want to celebrate their effort, not only in sharing their research with us, but also the helping us understand the science and why we found certain research. Um, I hope you all have enjoyed this opportunity to interact with, with them. Um, we are all part of one big FA community. Um, we all have different roles, but our common goal is find a treatment, find treatments for FA. And I hope you'll be back next year. Um, just reminded not to close your, the browser right away, vote for the, your favorite presentation and um, see you everybody next year. Thank you. <laughs>